How are you all doing? Fine? OK, good. OK, so this is Introduction to the Big Picture 101, OK? But more seriously, is how the ideas that form the architecture on how we educate people here fit with one another. Okay, so the main words are creativity, design. Very soon you will all be immersed in design thinking. And what defines us, this whole brain thinking. Okay, so at the root of everything that is worthwhile done by humanity, and I'm talking about from books, music, films. There is always a great idea, and at the root of that idea, there has been some creative spark. Okay, and this applies from products to systems to coding. Everything starts with one idea. Now, the main reason that I'll be talking about creativity and sort of expanding the way that we think is because uh, this increases the chance of solving problems and also uh, making sense of things, okay? We're all young, and one thing that happens when you are young is you are unaware about the speed at which things change. But I can almost guarantee that by the time that you finish, you will be aware of the speed at which things change. Um, so let me kind of take the long, long view here. And is if you could have one superpower, and it's the ability of predicting, let's say, a month ahead things, People will pay millions, billions for this, OK? The Economist magazine, every year, makes predictions for the year that is coming. And at the end of the year, they tell you what was the batting average of those predictions. And it may be, maybe, 50%, OK? A uh, hundred years ago, actually, 116 years ago, there was a fellow named Watkins who decided to make predictions for the century that was coming. So he collected opinions from the best brains of the day and published a list of predictions. This was published of all places in the Ladies' Home Journal. And if you want to see how much the United States has changed in 100 years, it was also published in Milwaukee in a German newspaper. So Milwaukee had a German-speaking population and a German-speaking newspaper. So I'm not going to go through many predictions. I'll just mention a couple. The one in there was one that we could nail down completely now, which it has to do with demographics. We know precisely know how many people will be in Russia 20 years from now in China, in India, and here, OK? The second prediction that automobiles will be more plentiful than horses, that may sound laughable, but it was not so laughable then because automobiles were just emerging. And in the year 1900, one third of all arable land in the US was used to feed horses, OK? So this by no means was a safe prediction. Moreover, they predicted that this will change the face of agriculture, and that's pretty good. Another prediction that was sort of off the mark was of how English will evolve. The letter C, Q, and X will disappear. Uh, that didn't come to pass. But in 1900, the frontier of technology was electricity. It was all the rage. 
And one prediction was that it would be possible to connect screens thousands of miles away with cables at that point, in which you will be able to see the coronations of the kings of Europe and battles in the Orient. Forget the cables, but this sounds a little bit like the internet. Okay? So, but the speed of change is probably more clear if I show you this. This is the, the time that it takes for a given technology to penetrate half of the market. So based on this, there is one technology now, because we're at four years there, there is one technology now that will pick before you finish in here. If I know what that technology is, I will be investing in it, OK? But we do not know what is it. But that's the speed at which things change. Now, we are talking about creativity, and creativity is surrounded by myths. And a few of those myths are there. Um, one is that creativity, there are some people who are blessed with this skill, and creativity is effortless. Okay? If any of you is in sports, you know that, yeah, you may be sort of have some initial advantage, but after that is practice, practice, practice. And it's the same thing here. Uh, the other one is that, uh, for example, art is more creative than science and engineering, which I don't believe for a second, and I will explain that. But the myth of creativity, and I will show only one example, has been populated by many people, including people who have been touched with this sort of magic wand of being creative. I do not know how many of you recognize Jack Kerouac, wrote a book called On the Road. Many of you may have had it in classes in, in your schools. The myth is that Jack Kerouac was so inspired that he couldn't bear to change the pages in the typewriter. You have to fit pages one by one. And he wrote the entire book in one sitting in this role. The role was auctioned. Recently, people paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for this. But this is a myth. It's not really what happened. Obviously, if one of these myths touches you, you are kind of interested in going along with it. And this is one of them. Okay. But what I deeply believe is this. At the highest levels, and it's not everybody, but at the highest levels, there is very little difference in between the creative skills and desires of a top artist, scientist, and engineer. Now, why, who am I to tell you this? I, I'll, I'll just say two things about sort of my, why you should be, you should believe me about this. So one side of me is the one who does research. And these are some of the covers where my work has appeared. Okay? These are highly desirable places to publish. Nature, science, proceedings of the National Academy. They are all images which are highly visual. I wouldn't call them art. But the other side of me does these kinds of things. So I have had sort of is once you're a writer, you're a writer forever. Once you're an artist, you, are, you cannot walk out from it. But that's why I think I have some sort of credentials to tell you about this. So, but let me tell you what's the central thesis for us, the Northwestern or McCormick way of doing things. And at the, end, at the center of this is right brain, left brain metaphor. It's a metaphor. Uh, neuroscience is more complicated than this, but the idea is that there is one part of the brain that sort of controls rational thinking, logic. If you have math skills, they will be on that side. And there is another part that creates more metaphorical thinking, divergent thinking, creative thinking. So for example, if you are a writer, you will be more on that side. OK? So what I'm going to mention is one experiment that was done by someone in UC San Diego. 
And this person analyzed lots of people who have had massive brain loss. In some cases, they lost completely the function of the right side of the brain or the left side of the brain. And what this person did, and his team, was give these people inputs, images, like the one that you see there, and then remove them, ask them, what, tell me what you saw. So the people who saw that letter H composed of little letters A, but had only the left brain active, this is what they said they saw. The people who had only the right brain active, this is what they say they saw. The important thing, and this is the point, is that in life, you have to see the big picture and you have to see the details. You cannot suddenly merge and someone will hire you because you see the big picture. First, they know, they want to know that you master the details. But eventually, you need to go beyond the details and see the big picture. So art, science, technology. If we sort of were asking for a show of hands of putting verbs under these three activities, then most people will put create in art, invent in technology, and discover in science. Uh, and I would say that in science, you will have more left brain components, and on the art, you will have the, the right brain component. Now, the point that I'm trying to make is you will all be highly desirable at the end of four years. Maybe five if you do lots of internships and co-ops or maybe if you squeeze a master's. People will like to hire you. And they will like to hire you because you will know how to solve problems. And at the center of your ability to solve problems is that you will be able to back things up with lots of quantitative skills, OK? You will, like, you will be able to solve problems because you have the ability of thinking in terms of systems, numbers, quantitative skills, analytics, if you want. However, even though analytical uh, tools give you an edge in solving problems, OK, uh, there is a danger in converging. It's a curse. Too much reliance on analytical skills may blind you into solving problems too quickly. Okay? And the point is this. There is no big price for solving correctly what turns out to be the wrong question. So our goal in here is to, besides you solving problems correctly, you will solve the right problem. And eventually, as you move in life, and you can have people working for you, and you assemble teams, people can help you solve problems. What no one can help you is asking the right questions. So whenever there is a big screw up, something that appears on the paper, forget about NASA confusing feet with inches at some point. Uh, most of the problems occur because someone has solved correctly what turns out to be the wrong question. So this is what we want to teach you. And how do we go about doing this? The way that we go about doing this, the way that we go about developing the right side of the brain is with design. So let me tell you something, because design sort of fits in between one extreme of science and one extreme in technology. How science, technology, and art evolve? In science, the biggest discovery of science is science itself, is the way that accumulation of knowledge works. The bigger the claim, the more the scrutiny. A bad claim or a false claim in science doesn't survive. 
it cleanses itself. If you come and say, I have discovered the cure for this, lots of people will double check this. So science grows methodically. There may be some dead branches in there. There may be some revolutions in between. Quantum mechanics being one, relativity being another one, Newtonian, but those are pretty rare. It just goes. Technology, you don't wait until some technology is completely exhausted for the new technology to come about. So technology grows slow, this sigmoidal shape. Then it reaches a plateau. But before that plateau is reached, something else comes along that replaces. The post office, maybe this is not the best example, was working fine before FedEx came along. Uh, CDs were working fine before they were replaced by flash drives, and that with everything, OK? Art is more like that. And why is more like that? Because if I show you this, and all of these paintings were done in between 1890, maybe 1950, and I ask you, put them in the right chronological order, unless you have taken a course in contemporary art or modern art, you will not be able to put them. So these are more. Another one, another one. And in fact, these two were done by the same person. Whereas in the same thing, by the way, will hold in things that are step below art. If I show you all of these chairs and I ask you which one is the most recent, which one is the oldest, again, there is no clue as to which one is, because design is at the essence of this. Uh, on the other hand, if I were showing these things, there is no way that you will guess that whale oil or a candle was an improvement on an incandescent light bulb. So in technology, there is a way of ordering things, although technology is more haphazard. They are bifurcations. So at some point in time, one third of the cars, way, way at the beginning, were electric. One third were steam power. And one third were combustion. And for a long while, combustion won. And maybe now the balance is reshifting. Okay? But there is an inherent order. So in technology, there is an order. In science, there is even more of an order. In anything that is art, is more disruptive. I'm telling you this because one of the things that is important to realize in here uh, that is at the center of uh, coming with new ideas are what are predictable and less predictable intersections. Many years in the past, if you converge in one of these circles, at some point, you'll make a decision whether or not you want to do mechanical or biomedical or computer science. All of these circles were like little islands. And now these circles are being combined. And some of the combinations of circles, what I would call pretty predictable, biology, computer science, are in here. But then there are less predictable ones. And computer science and journalism are kind of pretty close now our mechanical and neuroscience, because robotics is in the middle. But the point in here is that at some point in here, you will be aware of the frontiers of things. Okay? Uh, you are going to be sitting in a system in which you are going to be privy to the sum of all available knowledge. Although you'll not be able to look at all of these, you can move the head right or left, seminars here, seminars there. And the idea is, how do you go beyond that? Just go to the next step. What I can tell you is people pay a lot of money to be at those frontiers. There is an entire industry of conferences. Probably the best well known is TED, where an audience is curated of people who are at that frontier because they want to see the next thing. There are other conferences. The economy is one that I go, Renaissance Weekends. E-university, by definition, is where that nexus of uh, frontiers are. 
Now, let me give you a few lessons about technology and science, but looking at this from the viewpoint of art. So let me start with this one. So these are all basically essays on the same thing. Eventually, after doing many of these, Matisse did this one, which is regarded as a final painting in something that is called La Danse, which is in St. Petersburg. Okay? However, Matisse, when he showed up to his studio to paint, sometimes he was not particularly inspired, and he would paint the painting. In that case, you see the painting sitting on the wall of his studio, and in here is another one. Okay? So the point is, he was not going there because he was consumed with inspiration, ready to produce a masterpiece. Okay? Inspiration is overrated. You have to work at it. Okay? In here, you see Picasso at 15, maybe at 15 in there, 17, 21, maybe 40. You see an evolution in there. Uh, if you want going in the direction that you like it to go or not, but in here you have a guy of name Malevich, Russian. He was doing this at the beginning, doing this, doing this. And where can you go from there on? You go to this. <laughs> OK? But in every case, he didn't start with this. The lesson is you start with a solid grounding. And then you deviate from there. In fact, if you want to do something really new, you have to deviate from what is the common wisdom. You learn the craft. And then you have to be willing to set it aside. But first, you have to learn the craft. I made a comment about working hard. So in here, you have the productivity in terms of works of art of Leonardo da Vinci and Vermeer and Rembrandt, Van Gogh. Van Gogh did like 900 paintings in the last two years of his life. A fellow like Picasso that started painting at 15 and had a career that went up to 90 did, on average, something every 2.2 days of his life. And he worked even more, but he had a shorter career. So the lesson here is equate creation with hard work. There's another one here, which is really relevant to technology. This is called Baboon and Young. And it's a sculpture that is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York by Picasso. So when you look at this sculpture, you realize that he produced this by gluing things and then casting something with all objects that he found at his home in his studio at that point. So for example, the head of the baboon were two toy cars. And once you see the toy cars as the head of the baboon, it's almost impossible to think of one without thinking about the other one. The, the point is technologies are always an assemble of little toy cars, pots and pans. That sculpture was made with handles of Max in the years, for example. Technology is always a, 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 a an assembly of things that combine to form a new whole. You probably heard there is no new technology behind an iPhone. And it's true. It's on how the pieces combine to produce something that is new and emerges with power out of that combination. So the idea here is, and I like this quote from Picasso, bad artists copy, great artists steal. Stealing pieces to form a new whole. Okay? I don't know how many of you recognize this house. It's called Falling Water. It's one of the most 
sort of iconic piece of architecture over the last century. And it was done by Frank Lloyd Wright, who is local. Most of the houses that Frank Lloyd Wright has produced, they are all around Chicago. So it's called Falling Water because this waterfall follows under the house. Now, it's not that Frank Lloyd Wright decided to do a house with a waterfall in the middle. Okay? What he had was a client who came and told you, I will pay you this amount of money if you build a house here. This is the lot where I want to build a house and have a waterfall through the middle. So the point that is super important, and you learn it very quickly in design, is the ability of dealing with constraints. If there are no constraints, creativity doesn't move. You have to be able to live with constraints. And the one who said it also well was Orson Welles. He said, the absence of constraints is the enemy of art. If somehow you tell you, you have an unlimited budget to do this, no constraints, let your imagination go wild, you will freeze. Sometimes it's much better to have constraints. If you are designing something that has to work in the market in Africa, you cannot do it as if you are designing for the market in the US. And somehow your brain will start coming with ideas and will produce even better ideas. This one is more subtle. This painting is in Chicago at the Art Institute. And the story is that a collector from Chicago was visiting Picasso in his studio, and he said, he mentioned to Picasso he had this painting. And Picasso said, reputedly said that, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, when I did it, I had something in mind, but in the end I decided that it didn't work, and so I retouched this, and actually I cut a piece of the painting, I have it, and I give it to you. So, the Art Institute actually has the piece, except they never put it next to the painting. It's somewhere in the storage in the basement, OK? And this is the piece that this fellow got. So initially, Picasso had in mind that there will be the man, a man holding a fish that the baby was trying to touch. But at some point, he stepped back and decided that this didn't work. And then he simplified the painting and produce this. When you're about to finish anything, always look back and see if what you achieve is exactly what you wanted to achieve. Everything can be improved at the end, usually by taking pieces out. Okay? Now, let me tell you one thing. This will play much better in an audience who is probably 20, older, 20 years older than all of you guys, but I want to uh, mention this as kind of close to the end. Uh, the mythology out there in creativity is that people produce the best ideas when you are young. Okay? And in there you have some examples of people who did absolutely the best work when they were young. Niels Bohr got the Nobel Prize in Physics for work that he did at 28, OK? Uh, there are people who, Galois, one of the most famous mathematicians now, at 20. Then he was tragically killed in a duel, OK? But the truth is that this is not really true. Some people have done the best work in the 80s, OK? And I mentioned Frank Lloyd Wright before. Yeah, he did something amazing at 26. But if you have been to New York, to the Guggenheim, that he did at 88, OK? The lesson for you is not to make you feel like you have plenty of time to do great things. Usually, as I said, this goes much better when I give a talk to senior executives who are in the 50s or something like that. But uh, in here, you have. Frank Gehry uh, with the Guggenheim in Bilbao, overnight success at 66. 
Louis Bourgeois, even more, she's still producing stuff. She did that sculpture at, in the mid-80s, early 80s. Uh, so the lesson here, if you are trying to do something creative, is never, ever give up. You have to train yourself to come up with new ideas. And these ideas can happen at any moment in your life, from early to late. OK? So final point. I have mentioned Picasso a lot, so I'm going to end up with him. So this is a lithograph from Picasso. It's called the Bull Series. And that went probably very fast. But this was the last of 11 lithographs. It was the last in the order in which I put them. But if you start looking at the date, it happens that that one was the first, the second, and this one was the last. So what are the lessons in here? The lessons, and this is the most important one, is learn to see simplicity in complexity. There will be problems that will have lots of components, lots of things. Some people will lose the forest by the trees because there are so many aspects. But at some point, there is one central element that captures the essence of everything. That's in simplicity in complexity. But it's also the reverse. Once you see an idea, in how many ways the idea branches out? A good example of this is, you know, Watson and Crick, the DNA paper, the double helix. Very short paper, 900 words. The last sentence of the paper is it's almost the understatement of the century. It said something like, it has not escaped our attention that the structure so proposed, the double helix, can have interesting biological consequences. Well, the consequence is all biotech. However, it's very hard to see from one thing everything. And you can see what people were saying about the beginning of the internet and possibilities, no one saw even one fifth of what we see today. Okay? So the important thing is to train yourself in the art of doing both things, seeing the simple in the complex and the complex in the simple. Why, why this? Because I like to quote this, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. So what our goal for you is this, that if you, want, if you see this, you have the frame of mind of not seeing this, but rather seeing this. Thank you. <laughs>